2021 US Championship, I won a game. It was actually a game which got some some publicity because I promoted to a bishop. Check right here, right now. That's maybe he might play g8 and hit the clock first. What do you think? You mean a Rex uh, kill no, blunder? No. He, he, oh, put, no, he, no, he, no. he put the bishop. Oh, stop it. Stop it, Bobby. That's not cool. That's not cool. That's not nice. Oh, come on. What a guy. What, what a guy. guy. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the C Squared Podcast. Here we are another week later. A lot of things have happened in the chess world. Fabi, welcome back. Uh, excited? Yeah, it's good to be back. Um, I guess the chess world has been relatively quiet since the last week, especially compared to the week before. But still, there's some exciting things going on. Absolutely. And I think uh, the last time we spoke, it was in St. Louis, but the uh, uh, WR Masters hasn't finished at that point. And in fact, since then, obviously, we know what happened. It was Levon Aronian who uh, took down everybody else in the tiebreaks. Uh, he took down a Gukesh as well as a Nepo in a three-way tiebreak. And that was a fun one. I have to say, uh, we caught glimpses of uh, a former, let's say, Aronian. You know, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's the tournament. It, it he hasn't won a tournament in a very long time, so it was definitely good to see him back uh, at his usual self. What did you think about his performance? Yeah, he he had a good tournament. It started really well. Then he was a bit shaky in the last classical, last few class, classical games. He lost to. Yan and Pamiachi and a with White uh, in a game where he he normally according to the tournament situation had no reason to lose and he, at some point he was ready to repeat and then uh, Yan was very impressive he declined the repetition he played really really well he put pressure on him in a, in a very impressive way and yeah that was that must have been a, a really tough game for Levon to come back from. But the tiebreak, he played amazingly well. I yep. mean, he won three zero. He didn't. Uh, he didn't let even a half point slip up. Yep. I have to say that from the score, it looked one way, but the situation in terms of the games was a little bit less clear, uh, especially in the last game against Gukesh, where he was pretty much losing in the end game, and he somehow won. And that was the only way for the torn for the tiebreaker to be decided on the spot if if he won that game, a draw wouldn't be enough a loss would put him in a in a situation where he's not at all certain to win the tour, uh, to win the tiebreaker but he somehow wins uh, like uh, he's a pawn down in an end game he just he he somehow wins it it was very impressive and yeah, yeah overall of course he he has good reason to be happy i think also jan has good reason to be happy he won his last uh, last two black games he beat Keimer with black he beat levon with black certainly gives some confidence and this will be his final tournament, as far as I know, before the World Championship match against Ding Li Ren. It is indeed. And for Gukesh, of course, excellent tournament. Uh, I mean, he's he's uh, he's a young kid, so to tie for first, even if he doesn't win it, is is very good for him, of course. And I'm sure he'll be happy with that, even though I guess the tiebreaker did leave some disappointment. Um, I'm I'm mostly curious about Jan's emotions because for sure Levon is happy, and for sure Gukesh is happy, but Jan had a good classical portion and then the tiebreaker of course uh was was pretty lousy for him so maybe he had some mixed emotions before the match i'm trying to remember the last time he uh i think it was bucharest when he played uh, before the candidates and uh he was pretty miserable in in bucharest he had a pretty poor performance started off well i think he won a game and after that he slowed down and even lost one or two games finished on 50 percent or, or minus one it was definitely not what he wanted to see before the candidates but then it was like it was a completely new uh young in the candidates and he played amazingly so um it's very difficult to gauge let's say his interest in chess his form in general uh from only one single event but i have to say given the fact that especially with the black pieces on demand in the last round against Keimer, uh that was a very good game he won that uh, that must have left um a pretty sweet taste in his mouth but at the same time i remember that this game against uh gukesh in the tie breaks he was doing very well uh, i believe he was a 
pawn up if uh, I'm not mistaken, but Gukesh had this pawn on the H file, very advanced pawn on the H file. Yeah. And I was watching uh, the live commentary, I think it was Yasser and uh, the organizer of the tournament, and they were discussing, and Yasser sure was saying that, yeah, probably white, given the fact that that pass pawn is extremely strong, has some uh, glimpses of compensation, but not much more than that. And after that, Gukesh went on to actually win that, uh, completely swindle. Uh, Nepo in uh, that game I was watching Nepo was not happy shaking his head so and I think that probably wasn't his his last game but it was among the last ones so definitely I think that was the last game that he played maybe it was the last game that and he then played. there was a game yeah. Guk Gukesh against against Jan uh, sorry against uh, Levon Levon yeah yeah and and so if Gukesh had won that game which he was very close to then it would have been a very close fight but yeah, Jan wasn't impressive in the tiebreaker at all. Yeah. His game against Levon wasn't super impressive. Against Gukesh, he lost a position where, normally speaking, Black was not really risking any, anything. It, maybe Black was not much better, but to, to lose it was a bit extreme. I mean, he allowed the H-pawn, and he didn't really put up much resistance once it got difficult as well. So, so yeah, from a tiebreaker point of view, and of course... These days, rapid and blitz counts almost as much as classical, so so we can't discount the importance of that. Uh, definitely, on will have some cause, some reason for regret. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he has some bright moments to look forward to as well. the The thing is that usually, like we remember the the last thing that happened. Exactly. So if he had started off uh, very badly and then you know ended with a couple of victories in the classical, then maybe he would have more positive emotions than finishing very well in classical and then having this rather uh, lousy tiebreaker. And then he remembers, of course, all the the mistakes in the rapid that he that he made. Uh, I don't know. But as, as we've seen in the past and from Jan himself, uh, last year before he, he, he won the candidates, he played rather poorly, as you mentioned. And I think there's a, a number of other cases like, okay, when I won the candidates, I also played poorly before. When Karakin won the candidates, uh, he also played poorly before in Vikanze. And I think when Vichy beat Kramnik in 2008, he had a very, very lousy tournament before. So there's like a lot of examples of bad tournaments before the World Championship or candidates, meaning absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. I suspect that's the case as well here. Like, I wouldn't... I, I don't read much into Ding Liren's poor like Vikanze. He, he did actually play very badly there. Yeah. And he lost a lot of rating. I don't read much into that. And I don't don't read much into whether Jan played well or or poorly in, in his last event in the WR Masters. Um it just doesn't really it's just an entirely different event. You can't conflate the two. The the stakes are so much higher. That means that the motivation is so much higher. And of course, form will change depending on you know their preparation beforehand and how physically and mentally they feel beforehand. So there's a lot of factors, and just because you have a poor event, you know, a month before, or two months before, it really has nothing to do with the World Championship. Yep. Uh, of course, the World Championship. You know, who who is a favorite? Who can say? It's it's very difficult. It's not like normally. Last time it was Magnus against Jan, and we said, okay, Magnus is like at least a 70 30 favorite right uh but ding against jan uh, this is very close this I is thought about pretty it. much 50 50. I, I thought about it and i have to give jan the uh, upper hand uh, mostly because he has the experience he already knows um, how a world championship feels like he knows how close he was in the first uh, time from uh, winning a world championship title sure how close yet how far at the same time uh, right but uh, he has the experience and I don't think he's going to let a world championship title slip away from him a second time that's why in my estimation I want to say that he's a favorite 55 60 percent something along those lines um also, sure, maybe I'm influenced by the fact that Ding played quite a poor uh, Tata Steel. But also another thing that I don't like about Ding and I don't think is going to uh, improve is his uh, team. We don't know anything about his team. We don't know whether he has any support from uh, the Federation. 
We know that Jan most likely has a very proficient team, already a team that knows how to work for these type of uh, situations. He also has a lot of support, most likely. So due to those factors, I have to give Jan uh, the, the upper hand. And look, he has reason to the occasion. Whenever these big tournaments have happened in the candidates, in the last uh, two series of candidates, he has um, reason to the occasion. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick Jan, well, this time. we're and working sure... with a rather small data set, right? I mean, two we are. candidates in the World Championship, and Ding has played one, uh, sorry, two candidates. No, sorry, uh, three candidates, actually. Three candidates, yeah, yeah. 2018, 2020, which actually was split into two parts. So I don't know if you count that as two tournaments in itself. And, <laughs> and the last one, which Jan won, and Ding has never gotten close to winning one. Uh, in 2018, he did pretty reasonably well. He was plus one, and he had a theoretical chance to to win the tournament if he won in the last round and other results went his way. 2020, he played rather poorly. Uh, he was minus three at some point. Then he won three games. He went to 50%, but not even close to catching up to Jan when Jan won in 2020. And 2022, Jan ran away with it. Uh, nobody else was close, objectively. And Ding, he did... Ding, did win a must-win game against Hikaru, but it was must-win in the sense of getting second place. So it's that's a kind of weird situation that you can't really, like, you can't analyze it so much because uh, obviously in this in this match there is no second place. There's only you win or you don't. Uh, so Ding is a bit. Let's say he hasn't risen to the task so much in the candidates, although he has overall scored. Uh, plus two in his three candidates performances so that's pretty good uh Jan has obviously I mean two candidates wins you can't you know you can't take that lightly obviously that's that's very serious uh even if um let's say you know factors went Jan's way for that to happen of course he like everything came together in terms of his form and um and just everything went well for him in those two tournaments but still, I you know, there's like a handful of people in history who would even be capable if if they were at their best shape of winning two candidates. So that's very serious. On the other hand, Ding is is like very consistently strong. I mean, we can't really is. for a match player. I mean, he's actually excellent. Like you would think, match play is probably one of his strengths. Although we don't have much data to go by there, just because he's. So consistent, he doesn't really get uh, rattled too easily, uh, I think. Um, we can't really say for sure his psychological state, but he doesn't get rattled so easily. Uh, sometimes he starts badly and then he comes back, and mm -hmm. that's a good thing in a match format because I think Jan struggles, uh, unlike Ding, struggles when he starts very poorly. Like it, it, It's not often that Jan starts poorly and then he, he makes a tremendous comeback, while Ding does tend to do this. So they have their they have their strengths and weaknesses, um, but like yeah, I I wouldn't be comfortable picking a favorite if you put a gun to my head, and forced me to pick a favorite. I would probably also pick Jan, but it would be like you said, either fifty five or closer to fifty percent chance in in my view that uh, between the two players. Fabi, hold that thought, uh, and I'm sure we're probably going to rehash the World Championship uh, as we get closer to that. But right now we do have a uh, very special guest we do have the winner of the wr masters and that is levon aronian who will be joining us in just a second right now so let's try to get him on the line and ask him all the right questions and here we go we have levon with us levon uh good to see you man how's uh, how's it going wonderful wonderful i'm back to town man oh good yeah, yeah, you're back in St. Louis from uh, Germany. You uh, actually just won the inaugural WR Masters. That must have felt uh, sweet. Tell us about that. Yeah, for sure. You know, uh, as you probably witnessed, I wasn't really playing too well. I mean, uh, through throughout 2022 and uh, in Vikings as well. So it's good to kind of win a tournament and uh, kind of feel that I'm coming back to my form. Speaking How did you feel come, go ahead, coming go ahead, into the tiebreak? Because you had 
like a, a rough last few classical games in the tournament and then you had this three-way tie break were you feeling very optimistic well i kind of thought to myself you know i'm playing so badly in the classical i'm i think it first started with this game against Napa that i was too ashamed to play for a draw but uh, deep inside there i wanted to make a draw so yeah i should have just of course uh played a quick draw against him it would have made more sense and the next game i was already kind of shaky <laughs> so when it's I always was that difficult yeah sorry it's always that difficult moment when you you kind of want to draw but you're not 100 percent sure and then you're torn between these two things and it, it affects your play a bit yeah so in this uh, last before the last round of course you know as usual everybody expects you to fight with white and everybody's kind of saying oh you know you have a chance to clinch the title but deep inside i told to myself okay um i'm in the classical part uh, i mean i'm pretty shaky so it's time to finish the classical part have a rest and then uh, see what happens and i think uh, this was the right strategy kind of worked Tell us a bit of uh, what did you do between uh, Tata Steel, which was a very tame event for you, and WR Masters, because you came, it felt, with a lot of ideas. Why did you feel changed? What did you do in between tournaments that helped you to, uh, to have such a successful uh, performance? Uh, I think I had very positive time. So I went back to Berlin. And then uh, Ani and Zabel, they came to Berlin and I introduced uh, my parents to my daughter. Mm. Was this uh, the first time? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, my parents are, well, they're 75. It's not easy for them to travel to the United States or anywhere else. So we kind of thought this would be a good idea. I'm coming from a tournament and, uh, you know, to spend some time... Uh, you know, rekindling with family, so kind of having a good time. So it was really great. We went dancing a lot with Annie in <laughs> Berlin. I went around. Uh, and uh, the the thing is, uh, the, now that you're mentioning ideas, I think I, you know, I haven't uh, really worked so much in 2022. But uh, in Vikings, I kind of started uh, more or less coming back to chess uh -huh. during the tournament. And, and, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I and I've analyzed a lot during that tournament. Maybe that explains why I wasn't, I didn't really have the energy during the play. So I kind of gathered some thoughts, ideas, uh, what to play, and then uh, so in uh, Dusseldorf, I already had kind of more or less understanding what I want to play. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about one particular game, actually, uh, the one between yourself and Abdus Satorov, because he played this uh, dragon, and at least for us, it was a surprise. Uh, did it surprise you? And what were your feelings during the game and after the victory as well? Uh, you know, I think uh, with the dragon, I mean... Most of us, uh, even the new E4 players like myself, we analyze so much neither. And in neither of you continuously analyze this bishop d3 and bishop e2 and all kinds of lines where black can play g6. And, uh, you know, you, you get some very dubious version of, of, of dragon if you were uh, to get it. So you you normally get like a tempo down dragon, and still white is better. So when you see a, dra a straightaway dragon, I think uh, generally you can only welcome it. I'm not saying it's a terrible opening, but it's definitely an opening where black really have to play precisely in order to stay in the game. It's it's one of those openings like King's Indian, I guess, dragon, French, or you know where. They're strategically a bit unsound, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fabi. But the, these younger players, they they tend to enjoy like researching these offbeat lines that are a bit forgotten. Or okay, dragon is maybe not so offbeat, but a little bit forgotten, and trying to find some kind of computer way. Like I, I remember there was this when Anish did a course, and then everyone started playing this line, 
which uh, ends in an endgame with ops colored bishops. Like, more or less, not exactly forced, but more or less black is forced to go for an ops colored bishop endgame and then just grovel and suffer there. But there's some sort of mentality that you analyze this and then you can make a draw. And it's more of like a new school mentality, right? Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, obviously, in chess, there are a zillion ways to make a draw. <laughs> if you're analyzing uh, or deep enough, you're going to make a draw even in uh, most dubious openings because uh, I think white's advantage is really small. And uh, the fact is, I think uh, Duboff and Van Forest, the guys who look deeply into some lines, I think they added this specific approach to the game, which is very interesting. They they say, all right, I will go for a line that the computer thinks that is dubious, but since I analyze it deep enough, I'll make a draw. So I guess that's the newer approach to, to the game. We, I think, I don't know if I can uh, count you, Fabia, as my uh, generation <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit in the middle right between yeah, between yeah. those guys and, and your generation of players <laughs> yeah but i think we we don't like to kind of suffer or get some certain positions that you know you have to kind of be on the receiving end of, of the things i don't know it, it it's it's a definitely new thing i, I guess with with all those uh opening ideas this is something that magnus picked up from dubov as well right that like all these catalan ideas where the computer is very skeptical of white's compensation let's say where black takes on c4 and white has the standard knight c3 e4 and then play some h4 and some very slow vague play uh but of course it's very confusing for black so if your opponent is completely uh, in the woods, has no idea what the evaluation is or what the best move is, then it it's very scary. And it seems like Magnus uh, adopted that approach and was very successfully with the Catalans uh, in, in particular. Yeah, I think generally we have a lot to learn from the new generation. And that's what I really makes me excited, you know, playing with these guys that actually have a different vision and uh, they tend to disagree with uh, you know people's opinion and they can play different openings and one of course uh, example of that of course is uh, Abdus Satarov as well and also Gukesh I think their opening knowledge is uh, is not great definitely with black so they play lots of stuff so mm-hmm. uh, it's it's kind of uh, different approach from from what i'm used to i think i play all kinds of random stuff with white that i don't really know but with black i try to stay solid while these guys uh, have a different approach which is uh, of course uh, very very interesting i think there is a lot of sense in it speaking of this uh, new generation and uh, this change let's say of uh, generations we are starting to see players confirm. We've seen Abdus Satorov in uh, Tata Steel. Now it feels like Gukesh with uh, his performance uh, confirmed the fact that he is uh, a very serious contender to become one of the elite players. Did you feel like that as well? And uh, what was the difference of between Gukesh that you faced at Tata Steel and Gukesh that you fa- faced at uh, WR Masters? I think Tata still, uh, as a first super tournament, is such a rough event. I remember my first Tata still, and uh, it was also not easy. I think I've lost uh, maybe three games there. Hmm. So, And the uh, same happened uh, to Gukesh and uh, Arjun. Uh, of course, uh, this is kind of a test. And... I think for Gukesh, it was, it was important uh, that uh, he, he passed that test. Uh, I think closer to, to the end of uh, Vike, he, mm-hmm. he was already playing much better. Mm-hmm. And here he kind of uh, continued doing the same and, you know, just fighting, not really caring uh, about the openings. So, well, he's a fighter. I think he's one of the guys that 
is, um, you know, he's really a player. Kind of, he he doesn't really care about the opening ideas, more or less. So, uh, for me, it's kind of wonderful that all the Indian kids uh, they all have a very very different style from each other. It's it's a really marvel to see. He's uh he's definitely a player's player. Uh, let's say you know he loves uh, he he loves chess in general. Now uh, tell us a bit about your tournament. What was the moment where you felt like yes, I'm taking over this tournament. I have real chances uh, to 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 finish on top. Um, well, I think you know it started off really well, and then uh, I had a very different attitude from the start of the tournament. While in Vikense, I was kind of still uh, very cautious about my play, you know, doubting myself. Uh, in in Dusseldorf, I, I was more relaxed. I was just, you know, trying uh, to play for a win uh, with any color. And I can't really say that uh, I was totally sure of my success, but I think after beating Ganesh, well, I was leading the tournament. Um, I felt that this is everything that I'm doing is more is more or less making sense, you know, just playing and fighting. Mm. And speaking about this relaxation, uh, you used to live uh, full time in Germany, um, and you were mentioning you came back to Berlin. Some uh, very positive feelings came back as well. And you definitely took those over to uh, Dusseldorf. Did you feel like you were playing home? Was that playing into your relaxation, let's say? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I I think mainly the fact that, you know, I got to see my daughter, I got to see my parents. I haven't seen my parents for quite a long time. And uh, just uh, also in Dusseldorf, I was accompanied by my close friend, Thomas. So it was kind of uh, felt really good, you know, just to be around uh, the people that I love and uh, to have all the time to work and prepare. And I, I think there there was definitely a lot of excitement uh, in Dusseldorf uh, for me uh, because uh, I think generally, to be honest, somehow after a long time in Vikingsee, at some point, if you don't have a great tournament, you start getting tired, you know, of a little place. So you want to go somewhere. And eat. Yeah. yeah, I guess you, uh, Fabi is also familiar with this feeling. If yeah, definitely. But you definitely need to have a good tournament. If you're not having a great tournament, it's not too enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, the feeling between a, a good tournament there and a bad tournament is, yeah, at some point you start to go crazy. Um, I, I wanted to ask you because the WR Masters is one of the like few classical tournaments that has been added recently to the tournament schedule. Usually, we see like a lot of editions of Rapid and Blitz, and yeah. some of the traditional ones like Vikingse, and of course the World Championship Cycle. So what do you think about like the future of chess? Is it going to be more and more Rapid and Blitz, or will there we see like a return to classical chess now? I know how pessimistic you are, Fabi. I know you think that. Rapid is taking over everywhere. Uh, I don't know. You know, as a chess fan, of course, uh, for me, I rarely follow the the Rapids and Blitzes somehow. You know, it's just not enough time. And there is, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, when, when a classical game, you can always come back and kind of feel the, the tension and uh, the emotions. And uh, you can... You know, go for half an hour somewhere, come back, the game still goes on. Uh, Rapid is uh, it, it's not really for me uh, as a chess fan. So, of course, uh, I'm, I'm also a bit pessimistic, but I hope that people who love chess and who, who are getting into chess will, will kind of uh, understand uh, our point of view. That you know, classical is a deep game, and it's a game where you can actually, uh, really, from the first move to the last move, uh, play a perfect game without any mistakes. But 
On the other side, have you thought about this, Levon? With Rapid and Blitz games, you can play them online. You can play them from the comfort of your home. Now you're a family man. You have uh, a kid. You know, there's a trade-off. Uh, if you play classical over-the-board chess, you're going to have to travel all the time. You're maybe going to have to be away from your family, like in Tata Steel, for like three weeks. There, there's a huge trade-off, and it's building a, uh, in a certain way for you as well. How do you feel about that? Did you get to think about that at all? Uh, what are your thoughts? You know, Christian, the most frustrating thing as a chess professional that I ever felt is not being 100% sure that uh, your, you know, your opponent is not cheating or, you know, is not kind of uh, doing something illegal. Mm -hmm. And in online chess, unfortunately, I don't know, of course, I'm, you know me, I'm the least paranoid guy. But sometimes you have a feeling that I don't know. The, the opponent is the opponents are so strong in online chess, something they could never do over the board. So that is my concern. I I think sometimes I just get discouraged and I lose uh, this joy from chess when I when I just play online. So is I, that I, a, I, sorry, is that a feeling you had in the um, in the last tournament that the last online tournament that you played the Champion Chess Tour? A little bit, a little bit. I little hope bit not I... with me, Levon, because... <laughs> no, no, you were playing. I, uh, I, I know, yes. <laughs> You did too, though, you did too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 but it's just kind of, I don't know, you know, somehow this... I think the point of chess is, you know, competing against somebody else somebody you can see and feel and the online chess is kind of missing that somehow yeah that's yeah i very deep very deep uh, fabi go ahead no i i tend to have that feeling as well and i can't ever get it out of my head and then i'm not sure if i'm just imagining things if i'm paranoid because you sometimes get that feeling that you're being cheated against and then for sure it's not it's not always the case of course we'd sometimes get misguided ideas <laughs> but uh sometimes it might be the case and then it gets in your head and it influences your play so it is one of those problems who knows if there's a solution uh, i know solution but the solution is expensive you need just to have people you know you just need to kind of have people there kind of proctors or if you're organizing some tournament i don't know of a higher caliber than you know getting people to different uh environments like uh i don't know uh, the way they did it in some tournaments you come to a certain city and half of the people play in europe and half of the people play in i don't mm -hmm. know in some other city i don't know it could be arranged in, in many places in the world i guess well, they were thinking of doing that for the candidates, which was uh, postponed midway because they weren't sure if we would restart the tournament, when we would mm. restart it. Of course, it was during those uncertain times. And one of the suggestions was to have some players play from Europe, uh, some players play from Russia, and some players play from China. And I think, yeah, of course, this this idea has some other problems because then you have to trust that the whole organization is not, you know, that the proctors, for example, are are fair as well. Uh, at least for the candidates, it, it seemed a little bit too risky, and, and players objected to it for that reason. Mm -hmm. But but they did this successfully in the um, uh, what was the tournament called? The Global Championship. Global Championship. I think. Yep. yep. Uh, where they had some players play from Serbia and some from Toronto, and that that seemed to work out quite well. But yeah, of course, it's very expensive as well. So that's an issue for organizers. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Levon, yeah. now this was a, a first edition, this uh, WR Masters. Tell us your first uh, thoughts about uh, the tournament. Did you enjoy the organization? Did you have a good time? Oh, yeah. I, I think all the players had a great time. It was uh, 
well organized uh, in a very nice hotel uh, by the Rhine, you know, the, the river that mm -hmm. is considered holy for German people. And um, yeah, I, uh, I I had a great time uh, walking around, and uh, the city is quite nice. And um, yeah, generally the the conditions were very good. And uh, who who is? I I know you take a, a lot of pride in your bug house chess. Uh, who is, uh, let's say, uh, your more uh, worthy, your most worthy opponent in Buckhaus? Because you guys had quite a few matches and quite a few explosive matches during that tournament. Tell us a bit about that. Well, this was Buckhaus with a little bit different rules. These are so-called German rules. And my instincts were completely off. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> it's really difficult, you know, when you cannot put pieces with the mate and, you know, the whole, uh, lots of concepts are very different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think we should have, uh, I think we should have lost against Wesley's team. Um, who was Wesley partnering? That was a really strong team. And also against Napo, it was not so easy to play uh, their team. I mean, there are many good teams. Uh, um, unlike in uh, international rules, Buckhouse, where I think I have more of a experience and more of a clear understanding what the best move would be. Uh, I think here I, I was more or less uh, also in a guessing game, kind of trying to find uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. One of the rules, because I only played this this version uh, once when during the Singfield Cup last year, and one of the rules was very strange to me. It's that if you promote a pawn, then you can take a piece from not your opponent or not place a piece, but take it from your partner's opponent's board, which means that your partner can be in checkmate and be yeah. liberated from checkmate if you promote a pawn, which was a very strange concept to to my eye. Uh, I, I couldn't really get used to that one. So yeah. I think, it, uh, to, to be honest, it kind of messes up uh, the game. You know, you can have a perfect play, but then if you're down on, I don't know, three seconds and uh, your opponent can, I mean, your partner's opponent can place the opponent on the second rank and promote, then suddenly your whole <laughs> attack vanishes. So it's it's a strange concept. So, but you know how we are. We can play uh, with any kinds of. Rules, I think uh, chess players are just addicted to the game of chess. We don't care. Absolutely, Levon. Uh, once again, congratulations. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us. You are actually our first uh, repeat guest. So. And yeah, that's that's a thing. That's something. <laughs> uh, looking forward to see you at the American Cup in just a couple of weeks. Levon, uh, have a good night and we'll talk soon. Yeah. Talk soon, guys. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. Bye, 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 bye. Here we go. Uh, we got Levon Aronian in, in the house. That was a fun interview. It was... Uh, I, I just want to say one thing. Yeah. Because I, I thought about like the repeat guest thing mm -hmm. and... So we had Maurice on. We did have as, Maurice, yes. As one full time uh one full time guest. And then we had Maurice during the party at the US Chess Championships, yes. And and we also had him earlier before we even sat down with him. We did the um analysis of che cheating during the the Magnus and, and Hans saga. Yes. And Maurice was our uh guest who spoke about cheating in general. Yes. Um, so I guess he wasn't. Oh my goodness! I lied to Levon. What a situation. Well, I, well, I this hope... was the first like <laughs> double, double interview we did because th those were more like Maurice came on to give his expert advice on cheating and, and I think the U.S. Championship thing was more like we're just hanging out in a room together. Absolutely. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know if that one counts entirely. But yeah, it's it's good to get Levon back, and he has a lot of interesting thoughts on chess in general. So. Definitely interesting. No, absolutely. And uh, 
Uh, yeah, you will be facing him uh, soon in the American Cup. Actually, are you going to be facing him in the first round? or? From, from what I know, I'm playing Ray Robson in the first round. I, I think that's based on the March rating list. And so I'll just say the players because mm -hmm. there was a change mm -hmm. recently. So the first seed is Hikaru Nakamura, 27-68. I'm 27-66, tied with Wesley, I believe. Um, then we have Lanier, the fourth seed, and Lev on the fifth seed. And then Sam Shankland, the sixth seed. And then Ray Robson, seventh seed, and the last seed, who originally was going to be Jeffrey Jones, Jeffrey Sean, but he yes. dropped out for a reason which I don't know. And he was replaced by Sam Sevian. So that's the full lineup of the tournament. So I think I play Ray Robson. I'm not sure though. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Because it's it's maybe possible that I that Wesley gets counted as the second seed. Uh but I, I don't think so. I think I think I'm higher than Wesley, actually. I think Wesley is a few points lower the rate than me, so so I should play Ray Robson, who is 2702, which I think is his highest rating that he's reached. Absolutely. He did very well in the U.S. Championship, as we remember. That was his last tournament, his last uh, classical event in October. He played fantastic chess. He was in contention to win the championship all the way um, throughout the tournament. So definitely a, a mighty opponent. Uh, and you've played Ray quite a few times you've seen him play this type of mini matches as well uh, in fact he played against levon last year twice he played uh, against levon now what can you tell us about ray the type of player that he is and where you think you're going to match him the best well yeah ray is like a typical chess prodigy i mean this is uh if you would think like chess prodigy then you know, he, he started chess young. He became very strong, very young. I first met him, I think, in like 2009 when I was 16 or 17. I don't remember the month. And he, I think, is two years younger than me. So uh, we were rather close in age. But, of course, I was a little bit higher based on the based on the two years, which counts for a lot at that age. Uh, he went to university. Webster University, I think yes. He... he um, Maybe he wasn't sure if he wanted to devote himself full time to chess or not, so he he might have been in that sort of limbo between the two, you know, between university and work life and the chess life. Uh, I don't know if that stalled his progress because he he did stall for quite a long time. And he studied for a long time. He was uh, what I like to call a perpetual student. Um, he was there for at least six years, maybe more than that. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't actually know what he studied, but. Um, what his degree was in, but he he did always stay somewhat in chess, and he did always stay strong. And he's kind of also known for being like the best puzzle solver in the world, or or one of the best at least. Yeah. Um. So he has like this natural chess talent. It's it's very obvious natural talent for chess. Uh. The reason for why he didn't, let's say, ever break through to the top, might be. For other reasons, maybe worth work ethic or um, maybe some psychological reasons, because as we know, the gap in, let's say, chess talent or chess skill between the top of the top and just below the top can be rather small. Yeah, it can be small differences that make a big... It's minimal, yes. That make like a big tournament performance difference. Uh, but yeah, as like from our personal games, we've mostly played in US championships, so individual games. And... Um, I remember beating him in with Black and the Petrov in 2018. I I last time we played, we drew, and we might have drawn a number of games before that. So it hasn't been like I've uh have a massive score against him or anything. But I don't think he's beaten me yet. I might have, I might have a bit of a plus. That's a, like <laughs> that's a very uh, different story than what I have to say about Ray Robson. I beat him the first time, and after that, he beat me, I, I believe, seven times in a row. So <laughs> I'm not, I don't have a very good score against Ray. Uh, played with him. Oh yeah, Ray. Ray is tough. He's such a tough competitor, and uh, yeah, I like to call him the baby-faced assassin. 
Um, he doesn't mimic anything. He has a very uh, good poker face, I have to say. And I could never read him. And uh, one another thing that I could not do is out prepare him. He was always one step ahead of me uh, when it came to opening preparation when we were facing each other. So yeah, uh, no, I, I, he's, he's strong. I have to say he's good. He, he's very well prepared for sure. Uh, he he has really good prep. He has like a thought out, not very wide, but thought out repertoire with black and with white. He t does tend to mix it up, but he still with a degree of preparation. I checked our results and I'm plus three against him. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I forgot there was a game in the French I played where played like a very dubious opening, but ended up winning it. And in the 2021 US Championship, I won a game. It was actually a game which got some some publicity because I promoted to a bishop. Check right here, right now. That's Maybe he might play G8 and hit the clock first. What do you think? You mean a Rex uh, and kill no, no. He put oh, no, He put the bishop. Oh, stop no, it. Bishop. Stop oh, it, Bobby. Oh, that's not oh, cool. Oh, that's oh, not cool. Oh, that's oh, not nice. Oh, 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 come on. What a guy. What, what a guy. guy. <laughs> At the end, you underpromoted to a bishop. What, <laughs> you know, usually the computers give that as the best move because it gives up the least amount of material. Is that why you did it? No, I've just never done that before. <laughs> right. So I might as well take First time in your say, life under promoting to a bishop? I don't remember having ever under promoted to a bishop. No. Knight mm -hmm. is common, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even in middle games, right? There's some famous right. um, famous combinations like with uh, like promoted to a bishop. Mm -hmm. I remember Comple that game. Yeah, yeah. Completely you are unnecessarily, but I thought it was funny to promote to a bishop, so I did. You are close to a must win situation at that point. You know, oh, it was absolutely must win. I, I approached it as a must win. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's it's tough because he's also quite good in rapid and blitz, and he has a lot of experience in rapid and blitz. So, and this is a match which can go to rapid to blitz. You know, it's one of those matches, right? So, definitely tough opponent. I don't know what happens after that, depending on whether I win or lose, because it's not a it's not a single. Elimination tournament. It's a double to... elimination tournament. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, for, for... we will be talking about it uh, much more in depth, depth I think, uh, next week uh, as we get closer to uh, the uh, the American Cup. So, yeah, we don't have to go into too much detail in uh, yeah, that regard. Now, tell us a bit about uh, what you're going to do next. I'm hearing that you're going to Boston. You're you're you're, you're a traveling man. Yeah, and actually, it's quite exciting. So tomorrow I'm leaving in the morning for Boston. Uh, there's a, a, a sports conference, sports analytics conference called the Sloan. Uh, let me get it spelled right. S-L-O-A-N. Sports analytics conference, which is held at MIT. And it's a pretty big event. I, I don't know how many speakers there will be, but I think there are dozens of speakers. And... Uh, I checked, like, it's completely sold out. The tickets are a, a grand, and they're, it's completely sold out. 1G? Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah tickets are like 800 to a grand, and you wow. you can't get them anymore. It's uh, more expensive than the Lakers. Wow, that's... <laughs> hey, it's it's, it's going to be a big event. Um, so I'll just, like, say who the chess... Uh, because we're the chess uh, panel is, is going to have its own room, and, and it will have a few speakers. Mm-hmm. And so I believe Hikaru will be on the panel. Uh, I'll be on the panel. Jennifer Shahadi will be on the panel. Danny Wrench is going to be the moderator, from what I heard. And uh, and also Daryl Morey. Mm -hmm. I think you, you probably met him, right? Yeah, yeah. General manager and, of uh, Philadelphia 76ers right now. Yeah. Used yeah. to be with the uh, Rockets, I think. Yeah, I think so. He's, he likes chess. He's interested in chess. He has been for quite a while. And he, he like, for example, he came to the Sinkfield Cup one year. Yeah, we had dinner, I think, uh, that year. That yeah, year. so it's good. I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of our viewers are also uh, familiar with him. So that'll be a good guest to have on the panel. I don't know exactly what it will be. I think it will be generally about chess, mm -hmm. about the future of chess and so on. But I don't know if it's like very targeted towards one one thing or, or if it's just going to be very general. They haven't told That's you much about yeah. <laughs> No, no, I, I mean, I don't even know. Like, I'm just going to go there and 
<laughs> and answer what they ask me. You know, I don't know the details of it. I think that Robert Hess either will be on the panel or will be doing another event as well, but I know he'll be there. Uh, so that'll be, I haven't seen him in, in a while since the Olympiad. So that'll be good to see him as well. And yeah, it'll just be good to see everyone. And I'm quite excited for the event because hopefully, you know, I'll meet some interesting people, some new people I haven't met before, which will be fun. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Invite them on the podcast. Try to get some, <laughs> uh, try to get some guests for sure. Um, Cool. Yeah. Boston. That's exciting. Uh, can you s- watch this thing uh, on YouTube? Is it going to be translated I, live? Or... I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. Yeah. But yeah. it was, I did like look at the website and I'm listed among the speakers, which was kind of nice to see. Very cool. Very cool. No, uh, that's, yeah. that's, that's going to be a fun one for sure. Um, let's talk about the pro chess league as well. Uh, this has been happening in the last week. Some teams got eliminated. I believe, uh, the Cobras, uh, the Carolina Cobras, if I'm not mistaken, Char- Charlotte, right? Charlotte, Charlotte Cobras. Never mind. Right. Yeah. Um, they got eliminated uh, yesterday. Today it was the chess bras against the passers, uh, Green Bay passers or something like that. Well, there was two matches, right? But yeah, the last match was the chess bras with Magnus, Eric, Eric Hansen, Hansen. Uh, Sarich, and uh, Jay Dewey. I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. It's a like French yeah. Canadian name, yeah. Wille, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Um, and they won. They won against, it was a close match, relatively close, but they won against the uh, the passers, which had Sevian, which had um... Carissa Ip was Carissa Yip, yeah. In fact, Carissa she did quite she, well. She almost beat Magnus. In fact, she did. Didn't she was beat very... Eric Hansen also? She almost beat Eric and Magnus. She was one move away, Bishop B five, to getting a winning position position against Magnus, and against Eric as well. It was objectively winning at some point, so that was good. I mean, she's uh, she's really talented. Like we we saw her at the U.S. Championship several times. Uh, she's like 2,400 now. Probably will become number one in the United States at some point, very likely. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't enough. They they still lost the match against the Chess Bros, which is, to be fair, a very tough team. I mean, Magnus and uh, and also boards. I mean, all their boards are solid, but you have Magnus, who's always going to play very well. And then uh, Eric, I think Eric Hansen's a bit on the underrated side, so he's he's a very good third board. So yeah, tough team. Well, let's talk about uh, your match coming up on uh, the third. You guys are in a must-win situation because you lost your first two matches. Um, tell us a bit about the last match. You got three and a half out of four, if I'm not mistaken. So you definitely performed. What happened? Yeah, yeah, I did well. I beat. Um, I drew my first game, which yeah, I mean, I was slightly better. I guess throughout, I always felt like I was a bit pressing, maybe even much better at some point, but I was playing a very solid guy. Um, I actually can't remember his name at the moment, but, but, uh, let Aditya, me check. Aditya Mittal. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very, very solid. Probably like 17 year old. Very good player. Yes. Indian kid. Uh, you know, like half the games I play now are against young Indian players. So, <laughs> and then I then I did very well. I, I beat Harika in a rather shaky game, but still still I won that one. And then I I played two good games against Tabat Tabay and against Arjun. But it wasn't enough. Like I knew I had to kind of win both those games. But it just like the team was too far behind. Harika did so well. She like scored plus one. She did amazing. I mean, their last two boards scored plus one, fifty percent and plus one. Uh like you you just can't compete with the team when they're their last two boards, they're scoring a plus. It's just there's no, nothing you can do at that point. So, so we were we were beaten without much of a chance, I have to say. Yeah. Uh, we play Berlin next. Okay. The Berlin Bears is the name of the team. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll just because the players are known, like it's already the lineup is known. So our team is going to be. I'll be on first board. Benjamin Bach on second board. Uh, Nicholas Theodoro on third board and Alice Lee on fourth board. Alice Lee, I think, is like 13 or 14 years old, so also really talented, like 2284. No, no, she's 2362 right now. 
Uh, I'm just looking at their she's website, really like on the chess.com. She's really, really good. Yeah. Okay. I didn't realize she was so high because they put her rating here as 2284. Maybe recently she gained a bunch and they didn't she, update it. She, she gained a bunch. Uh, I'm not 100% sure whether she made a GM or an IM norm. I believe it was an IM norm, but uh, she's highly, mightily talented for sure. And I think she's a good addition to the team. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I think that. Uh... She has good chances to score. I mean, she'll be an underdog against most of the players that she's playing against, but still, I, I think she has good chances to score. So our team th that we play against, Matthias Bluebaum, 2650. Eric Braun, I think rather inactive player, but around 2600. Haven't heard that Michael, name in a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's. I played him a few times back in the day. Michael Bezold, 2481, who is an older, I mean, I don't want to say older, but like by chess standards these days, older player. Um, and their fourth board is Sarah Pop, who is twenty two ninety four according to the Chess dot com. Uh, She's a good player. Yeah, I, I don't know her at all, but but yeah, from I Hungary, guess. Um, <clears throat> very decent player. But yeah, around twenty three hundred. Is she like originally Hungarian, or did she marry Hungarian? Ah, it might be Sarah Holt, which became Sarah Pop. By Mary yeah, Pop because like Gabor. Sarah, yes, Sarah yes, is such a yes, non-Hungarian yes, yes, name. Yes. That's what I was thinking. Yes, 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 yes. No, okay. um, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's a, it's a former well, Sarah Holt. Yeah, I I, I know her. Okay. I know her for 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 a very very long time. Decent player. For yeah, sure. I was just thinking like Sarah is so non-Hungarian. <laughs> it sounds very German. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like a very German name, right? Yeah. So so yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I think we're favorites. That's my feeling. But anything could happen. But how, I really think that... How like, are you guys approaching the match? Did you guys discuss strategy? Did you connect with anybody? Like, what's what's the plan? No, no, I, I haven't um, spoken to the other players on, on my team. So I'm going to be playing from Boston on the 3rd. And right after I have to run to the conference. Like, I, I don't have much of a time period. Uh, I don't have much of a window. Maybe to... you will have to play from the conference. No, no, I, I have time. I made sure that even if it goes to like a playoff, I'll have time to play and make the conference. But yeah, it'll be a bit of a, a rush, I guess. But the reason I think that we're pretty strong favorites is because I look at our boards two and three. I feel like four is probably pretty close. Always a coin toss. But boards two and three, we have Bach and Theodoro, and I think they're much more experienced in this sort of online format format than Arik Braun and Michael Bezold. That's my feeling. Yeah. I, so, I can definitely see that. And and if I score normally, then on the first board, I, I shouldn't be outperformed by by their first board. Although, you know, you never know, right? I Anything can happen in these matches, right? But hopefully I, I don't perform badly. And, I, and then I think that our boards two and three will, will pull through for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Not for sure, but, you know. That's definitely going to be Hopefully. a match that I'm going to be uh, following. And uh, we were discussing that you were moving in the last few weeks. How is that? <laughs> How is that going? Have you no, managed I'm, to I moved in? To, I moved in. Move in. I don't have all the furniture. And like I, I got the essential stuff. Like for me, the essential things because I don't need a TV are like stuff that I can cook and that my kitchen is well stocked. And that I have a place to sleep. I, I don't actually need, like in the short term, I don't need a TV and I don't need uh, a coffee table. But I, I, that stuff is on the way as well. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, good to hear about that. Now, uh, to close it off uh, for uh, this week, let's tell the people where they can find us. They can find us on uh, Discord. A lot of you have joined. It has become quite um active as well a lot of people are writing so we appreciate that we like to see activity in the chat uh, you guys discussing all sorts of ideas we love to see that so uh, and we love to engage with you so find us on discord that's where we're going to chat directly with you guys of course we have uh, a TikTok. we have we're pretty much on every single platform and you will be able to find all of those things in the description below so check that out for sure and uh yeah fabi it's been a good week another good week on our way get some rest get some preparation going good luck 
in uh, the Pro Chess League match. It should be a fun one. And uh, I will see you next week. Yeah, sounds good. See you next week. Cheers, guys.